the shady green pastures so rich and so sweet God leads his dear children along where the waters cold flow bathes the weary ones of feet God leads his dear and so sweet God leads his dear children along where the waters cold flow bathes the weary ones of feet God leads his dear children along
befall us and Satan oppose. God leads his dear children alone. Through faith we shall conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children alone. Some through the and so sweet God leads his dear children Satan oppose, God leads his dear children alone. Through faith we shall conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children. Come through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through his blood. Some through
the night seasons and all the day long. In the night Shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet. God leads his dear children along. Where the waters flow, bays the weary ones of feet. God leads. His dear children alone. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through His blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a soul in the night seasons and all the day. Shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet. God leads his dear children along. Where the waters flow, bays the weary ones of feet. God leads. His dear children alone. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through His blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a soul in the night seasons and all the day. And Satan oppose, God leads his dear children alone. Through faith we shall conquer, defeat all our foes. God leads his dear children. Some through the waters, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through His blood.
the night seasons and all the Satan oppose God leads his dear children alone Through faith we shall conquer defeat all our foes God leads his dear
so rich and so sweet. God leads his dear children alone. Where the waters cold flow, bathes the weary ones of feet. God leads his dear children alone. Some through the I hope that you had a blessed and wonderful week. And I know your week was blessed because you're here. 
So the Lord was doing some kind of powerful working in your life. I welcome all of you here that's in the sanctuary this morning, and I welcome our family and friends who are worshiping and studying with us online this morning. We are going to uh, have our opening song this morning, uh, which I'm not exactly sure what happened to our minister of music. Our opening song is Guide Me Thou, O Great Jehovah, Brother DuBose. Okay, we're going to sing that, and then we're going to get started right into our lesson study for this morning. This morning, we are continuing our study of managing for the master. And this week, our lesson study was what? Offerings for who? Offerings for Jesus. Last week, I, I said I, I hope you weren't going to throw darts at me, but this week I came with a bulletproof vest on under my clothes. Um, and so if you're going to be pointing at me, I'm ready. I'm only ready, though, because the Lord is here, and I'm representing as you are his desires and his goals for us. So shall we bow our heads this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this guidance that you're giving us this entire quarter about how to manage for you. This morning, Father, we're talking about the offerings we offer for Jesus. And Father, we know that we have some difficulties, and the difficulty that we have is us. So this morning, Father, I ask that you move us out of the way, that we allow the Holy Spirit to lift you up in our hearts and in our study so that we can clearly see that better good that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Offering for Jesus. Our lesson uh, memory text this morning was found in Psalms chapter 116, verses 12 through 14. And if we have that, 
Can we read it together? Psalms 116, 12 through 14. And it reads, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. So besides tithing, there are offerings, the, the author of the list says, that come down from the 90% that remains in our possession. Because how much are we required to return in time? 10%. So how much does that leave in your pocket? 90%. And as I said, my friend, Elder Robert, uh, Robert Casey used to say, the means are in the genes. So beyond that 10%, we have 90%, and we still have a responsibility to manage that 90% as well, don't we? Well, I want to ask you a question. I see the command that says that we need to tithe. Is offerings mandatory or optional? What do you think? Are offerings mandatory or are they optional? I want to ask you a question. I see the command that says that we need to Yes, Elder. Okay. All right. So Elder Olo says she doesn't think that offering is mandatory because she doesn't think that tithe is either because with God, he leaves everything up to us and it's a choice. And I saw Pastor Odo's hand go up. that also as a mandate. So it depends which way you're looking at it. Okay, depends on which way you're looking at it. So as Christians, we have an end goal in mind. And in order for us to get to that end goal, God's commands are, to me, my opinion is, they're commands. He is wanting us to do these things. He's not saying you can do it if you want to or not. He's saying, I'm commanding you, this is what I want you to do. That's my take on what it is that he's asking us to do. But when God gives these commands for us to do, all of his commandments are what? Enablings, right? So when he asks us to do these things, does he make provision for us to do them? Yeah, does he give opportunity for us to do them? But we have a problem, and the problem that we have is us. And so we're going to look at the motivation for giving because that's what God does. He looks at why we give. We love God because what? because he first loved us. We see in John 3, 3, 16, it says, God so loved that he gave, okay? He loved and he gave. 
And so if he is our example in everything, then that would be where we're coming from. He loved us, he gave. We love him, and so therefore we give to him or return to him. But the truth of the matter is, even though we're spending this time talking about tithes and offerings, which is money, the reality of it is, does God need our money? He doesn't need it. He doesn't need it. Why then does he ask for something he does not need? Ah, okay, here comes the microphone. Sister says the reason why God asks us to give something that he doesn't need is what? To keep us attached to him. To keep us attached to him. Okay, I like that answer. I see another hand back there, Elder Odom. Yes, ma'am. It's all to do with obedience. It has to do with obedience. obedience. That's the main aim. The main it's aim, okay, is God obedience. We're going to obey what he says to do. And sometimes he tests us in sinful little things. Uh, can I just share an example? Yes. And when I got there, I didn't like what I see. They were playing music with cursing in it, and the doctor was pretty rough. And I says, okay, I'm at a tender moment. I can't go through this. So I, I, I just before I was ready to go, I had this awful tummy ache. I don't, it just came out of the blue. So I said, Lord, is, is this you trying to tell me not to leave home today? So I got on my knees and got my Bible open. I started praying, and he said, go. So I went. The next day, I was supposed to go back, and he told me, do not go. So I had to work it in my mind. God was leading me not to go, and I, I told Wayne that he was testing my obedience to him. Even though I had a stomachache, should I go or not? And I did go, because he said so. So I think it was a test for me. You know, knowing him as I do, I think that was a test. Okay, thank you. I see another sister's hand here. The question is, why, does, why do you think God asks us to, to give when he doesn't need it? Okay, so the giving, as um, said by others, um, is also to impact other persons around us. Because remember, as light bearers, Christ wants us to reflect him. So basically, um, whatever is in our heart, that's what we'll do. We're giving from a cheerful heart. We're giving out of a heart of gratitude for what Christ has done for us, therefore impacting others around us. Okay, all right, and I see one more hand back here. Yes, Sister Estes. Yes, uh, what I take from it is that God, he's so generous and he gives to us even on the cross. So when you don't give, that's just being selfish. And on top of all of that, when I was out there in the world, because besides, this is a commandment too. And this is to show if you love God or not, if you don't often. Plus, it's a, it's a commitment. And also, um, I got a testimony. Even when I was out there on drugs, I knew when I was working, I knew that I mean, it's a blessing and it's a curse. Well, I want to be, of course, I want to be blessed. If that means all I had to do is pay my tithe, then, hey, I want to be blessed. Not only are you going to be blessed that way, but you're going to be blessed on, on, you know, just on and on, in and out, just in his blessing when you give. And then it's like the, the other reading said, it's, it's called trusting and believing in God to, to try him, because he said try him. So, yes, why not? Because, I mean, this is sovereign God of, of the universe. And then when I was out there in the world, just like I was, when I was out there, I knew even, I didn't make much, but I paid, I was on drugs real heavy. But I, the 10%, I had, in my heart, I had a mind to just give Christ 10% of that money. And I did with the offering. But, I mean, now that's a testimony. But I would let my mom keep it. And, uh, you know, a few times uh, I had took the, the offering to tie it back. I had took because, hey, I ran out of money for drugs. I mean, I, I didn't feel good about that. But a lot of times I didn't. And then when my mom, when she, she was saying, well, Wendy, don't give me your tithe, and you're going to take it back. So that stuck with me, so I would never, when I, when I give it to her, because I mean, that took a core in my, in my heart, because she didn't, have, she didn't have to say that, because I already felt bad by taking it back anyway. 
to give to the devil. So I just want to thank God, even with a mind out there on drugs, he was still blessing me then. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So giving, is it for the giver or the receiver? Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor. Yeah, I would like a little bit more clarification on the thought that God does not need our money. Because if he doesn't need it, how would his work go forward? I'm sorry, Dick, didn't hear that last yeah, part. If God does not need our money, uh -huh. how would his work go forward? So I just need a little clarification on that thought. Does God need it or does he doesn't need it? All right, I have a, a, an answer, but the pastors put a question out here. Does God need our money or doesn't he? He said, how is the Lord's work going to go forward if we're not giving? Does he need our money or doesn't he? Sister Joanne? Uh, I think God does need our money. Not that he couldn't do uh, things differently, but God has limited himself. And uh, he has uh, brought us forth to uh, multiply and to get spread this gospel message. Uh, if we love God, we are moving and doing, managing our funds out of obedience, out of an act of love. Um, and yes, we do need to act out of love and be obedient uh, because returning tithes, is, we said uh, last week, is a way of how God wants us to help spread the gospel. Uh, it helps to go for the uh, worldwide ministries and, and things that the pastors need salary-wise and biblical workers, that sort of thing. So we definitely need to do our part in returning. And then when we uh, give offerings, um, I, I think uh, several things happen. Number one, uh, giving um, shows uh, our obedience. Uh, sometimes God tests us, our faithfulness, our loyalty to uh, whether we give or not. Uh, and I also think that giving uh, helps to bring out uh, decreased self-centeredness and a selfishness in us. Also, it helps to uh, further the cause of the needy. Uh, the Lord said, and as much as you've done things unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So God's um, plan is, is, is multiple fold in, in our giving. It's, it's an act of obedience, trust, and loyalty, as well as decreasing selfishness and tending to the needs of our uh, neighbors and, and loved ones and the least of these. So the question, again, is a matter of interpretation, I think. Does, the, does God need us, our money, or God, does God want our money? We see examples over and over in scripture that there are things that God wants from us that he has wanted from his representatives, from his children in different dispensations of time that they didn't give. Did it stop his plan one bit? It altered it, he changed it, he used different methods and processes, but it does not change what God, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it does not change, could you bring me some water please? <coughs> It does not change what, he, what he's going to do. So does he need it or does he want it, Pastor? Yeah, I think strictly, strictly speaking, God doesn't really need anything. It says in Psalm 50, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. He said, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. But he's trying to give us an opportunity, now that man has fallen, to develop our characters. And uh, that's the purpose, uh, to allow us to give that we can be like God, who is, who is totally giving in everything. So he wants to redeem us, and so in a sense, it's needful for us to give. The other thing, like you said earlier, all of his uh, commands also have enablings. 
And we see that it was mentioned that three times a year he, he required the men to come to Jerusalem. And he told them not to come empty handed. But when he told them to come, each time was a time of harvest. When, the, when he had already provided for the people. At Passover was barley harvest and Pentecost was wheat harvest and then tabernacles was fruit harvest. And for those who even had not, they could glean because the people were instructed not to totally strip their fields, but to leave an area for those who were less fortunate that uh, they could glean and they also could bring something. So God provided the means for them to give and for us to give. Okay, so I ask, who benefits from the giving, the giver or the receiver? Both, both benefit from the giving. And therein, I think, for me, started the conversation that I was having with the Lord about this whole thing about giving. When our memory text said, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? What does that word render mean? What will I give? What will I return for all of his benefits towards me? So the question is, what benefits have you received? What do you think that you would receive? In that next uh, statement, he says uh, that he is going to lift up the, the, the psalmist says he's going to lift up the cup of salvation. And maybe if we start to unpack, because if I started asking you to tell me what you are thankful for, for all of the benefits that he's given. I'm sure you're going to start sharing with me some things, and I'm going to ask you, because I think we gloss over on a daily basis really what the Lord is giving us and what he has given us. So let's start there with what it is that we render to God for all he's given us. We talked, I think it was last week, about two gifts in particular that the Lord gave us. Two in particular. Do you remember what that was? The first hit gift he gave us was the gift of Jesus Christ, right? And then the second gift, through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ gave us the gift of the, the Holy Spirit, right? So when we start there, that we have been given Jesus Christ, who because of his saving grace, we have salvation. When we start unpacking that and just not just glossing over it, what it means for us to be thankful um, for the benefits that he's given towards us. Jesus gave his life for us, right? But his love has been relentless. Doug and I were, were on vacation, and the, the, the beach that we were on, the waves rolled in all day, all evening, and all night. And you would hear those waves crashing against the beach and depositing you know, all these little particles of sand, etc. Those waves were relentless. They just kept on coming and just kept on coming. And the sand that was on the beach is more the particles than we could ever hope to count in 15,000 lifetimes. And that's how God's love in what he gave to us through Jesus Christ is for us. Not only did he have his saving grace, but his love is relentless and he just keeps coming after us and coming after us. But he died sacrificially so that we don't have to die that second death, right? But he's not still dead. He, where is he? Hmm? He's alive. He's alive and he is interceding for us daily, every minute. So for his high priestly ministry that brings us salvation, we're thankful. What has God rendered for us? All these things. Pastor, I see your hand. Excuse me. 
Uh, we are told that the cattle upon a thousand hills is God, the earth is the Lord's, and so on. So I'm just wondering, does God get any benefit from what we do? Since he has everything already, does he get any benefit? Does God get any benefits from what we do? Nobody wants to take that on. I see another pastor's hand going up. <laughs> I think at, at the center of the word of God is the great controversy, which is a controversy over the character of God. And it's actually the saints that vindicate God. They become a witnesses, witnesses to the goodness of the Lord in contrast and contrary to Satan's position. Satan is saying that God is unfair, that he's unjust, and in fact accusing him of the very things that, that Satan is, selfish and about self-exaltation, and yet in God and Christ we see just the opposite of that, the ones who occupy the throne humiliating themselves for our salvation. So for whatever reason, God has put or allowed human beings here on this earth, the sons and daughters of Adam who, who because of their unbelief and disobedience, rejected him, become the very people that will vindicate him before the universe. And so all that's a part of the benefit. It's worked out. And God alone gets the glory as a part of the process of salvation. Can I get a witness? He needs a witness. We're his witness, right? And we'll witness to what he's done throughout all eternity. That's going to be something. What can we render to God for the benefit of the Holy Spirit that he's given us? Because the Holy Spirit is now what's working inside us, right? And because of his Holy Spirit, that's where the new birth comes from. That's where the transformation of our heart comes from. That's who convicts us of sin. That's who gives us the, the, the desire to repent. That's who gives us the fruit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and leads us into all truths. That's what we're getting from the Holy Spirit. So when the psalmist says, what shall I render to God for all his benefits towards us? He saved us. He changes us and transforms us. And then he's still not done. What else is he going to do? He's going to give us eternal life. He's going to give us a glorified body. He's going to give us immortality. We're going to get to live with him throughout all eternity. We're going to get to be his friends. He's going to be here with us. What has he given? What shall we render to God for all of this marvelous things that he's given us? We need to give him and render everything to him. What, a, what is our motivation for giving? On Monday's lesson, the author asked us, um, what does God promise to do for us if we obey? And I think Elder uh, Odo said one of the things is we need to obey, right? Because he says, if you love me, you'll... Right. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll obey. So what does God promise to do for us if we obey him? What did he say? Did anybody read those scriptures? Matthew 6, 31 through 34, and Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. What will he promise to do for us if we obey him? Yes, ma'am. Bless when you come in, bless when you lie down. But pretty much bless um, holistically. You'll be blessed in every area of your life, basically. Okay. So he is going to meet all of our needs, and he is going to bless every aspect of our life abundantly if we obey him. 
Yes, sir. I just need a clarification on that because there are a lot of people in the world who are very faithful to God and they're in abject poverty. They're not blessed with clothes. They're not blessed with money. Um, so, does God bless everybody who uh, are faithful to him? Does he bless them in all these things that he says is going to add to us? My answer is, shall I wait? Because I see some faces and fingers doing this. Anybody? I think yes, he does, Pastor Odo. Because we think about these blessings as material and temporal. And I think God looks at it from another perspective. When he's blessing us and he's looking at all that he's giving us, it also has an eternal weight to it. It is not just down here. So if it is that we would only get these things from him and, and so that we have money, that we have materials, that we have possessions, etc., and everybody doesn't have that, I mean, we know that there are people who are starving. We know that there are people who are dying from starvation. We know that there are people who have health challenges and issues and that they die. We know that everybody's children do not, uh, well, at least that we can't see that the, the, the blessings that we're praying over their lives and baptizing them in prayer, we don't necessarily always see the benefits of that. But does that mean that he is not blessing every aspect of our lives, if we consider that he has given us this earth to occupy, but he has limited the number of years on this earth that we get to occupy, but he has not limited the blessings that he's going to give us throughout all eternity, I think he's blessing. It is a challenge. It's a challenge for us when we're struggling in our life, isn't it? When God's not answering you, or if something is coming that you definitely were not praying for, but Paul is saying, but in everything, be grateful. In everything, be thankful. Be thankful when the candidate that we voted for didn't get into office. Be thankful that we've had a pandemic that has turned us topsy-turvy for the last two and a half, three years. Be thankful that we still have to wear these masks. Be thankful that in everything, be thankful. How do we find the elements of thanksgiving when we're hurting? Pastor? Yes, I, I, I was fully aware of God blessing us in more ways than money. So I wasn't so much dealing with that. He can bless in numerous other ways. I was dealing with what the text was actually saying. And I'm just going to read it here. It says, um, therefore, take no thought, saying, I'm looking at Matthew 6 and verse um, 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? So I'm just looking at those three things, eating, drinking, and clothes. Forget all the other blessings and benefits. So I'm just saying, if a person is faithful to God, does it mean they'll never have an eating problem, never have a drinking problem, never have a clothes problem? It doesn't mean that. But I look at Jesus Christ. He said, I don't even have any place to lay my head. That's the Lord of the universe. So I think it is our perspective, our natural perspective, to look at things from a selfish point of view. If Jesus himself didn't have a place to lay his head. Uh, I see a hand, so I'm stopping. Yes? Um, Elder Coffey, what came to mind when Pastor Odo uh, raised that question about the people who are having these challenges and uh, these struggles, and you know, how do we reconcile that they're supposed to be blessed when they're, they're facing these difficulties, 
the first thing that came to my mind is they're alive. They exist. They're able to complain. The alternative would be for them to be in the ground. So that in itself is, is I see as a blessing. That's what each and every one of us want here, is to live forever. So the fact that they're alive and able to complain <laughs> or, or, or you know, pray or go through these trials, I see that as an ultimate blessing in itself. Mm. Okay. Do I see other hands? Okay. So is it selfish on our part to claim the promises that God offers us? So we only give to him because he, because he gives to us, because we get things. <laughs> I'm not going to keep talking because I want you guys to talk to me. Do we only, are we only thankful to God because he gives us things? Is it selfish if we claim the promises? The promises are there for us, but do we only feel thankfulness because we have things or he gives us things? I just want to say there was a time when my mom would say, um, and she probably still says, that um, you can never repay me for the things that I've done for you. And be, being younger, and my smart Alex would response was, well then, I, I won't try. I won't even try. But being older, and seeing the sacrifices that my mother made for me and not understanding at that time, then I've grown a little wiser, myself and my siblings, and there are things that we do for my mother, not because she, not because I owed it to her, but because of the love that she had for me when I didn't know it. And so with that love that she had for me, it just reflects of what we do for her now. So in the same thing, when we talk about God, who like families here on earth, we are a little reflection of what God is. He did the same thing. He loved us. And when we understand that love, um, the things that we do, it's not because he gave us, but it's because, uh, not because in the beginning that he gave us, because we understand that love. And I'm not giving him because I feel like I, have to, I owe it to, to him, or I'm indebted to him, which I am, but because he freely gave and loved, then I freely give, give and love him back. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay. Other comments? Yes. I just want to agree with Nikki that in the process of giving back, it's not like we stop to think about it. When there is love, and we recognize, and we felt it, and we were nourished by that love, it, it comes. We don't stop, reflect, okay, I'm going to give now because I love back, because I'm giving back. It's just, it's just part of you. You can't help it. We can't help it. But the reality really is, as Pastor Odom shared, that there are a lot of people that aren't feeling that in the day to day. And the truth of it is, we don't always feel that in the day to day either. But God is still wanting us to return and to render to him what is rightfully his. Because nothing that we have, whether it's as Elder uh, Beckham said, this breath that we're taking right this second, that's not ours. He gave that to us. Everything that we have is his. A person who is generous will usually be rewarded. God does reward those of us who are generous. The reward doesn't always come in money, I wrote in my lesson here, and it doesn't always come in this life. But God does bless people who are generous and who, yes. So I was just thinking, Elder Coffey, as we've been talking and, and thinking about uh, 
Elder Oldest question and Elder Beckham's response. Um, sometimes, uh, even though we have this breath, this life, not everyone feels like this is a reason to be grateful, to be thankful. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, a couple of the students that I work with, and, uh, and, and of course they're young, and oftentimes the ones who are really contemplating suicide are thinking that death has to be uh, better than what I'm going through. Uh, but most recently, um, I misquoted a, a, a scripture, uh, and the, the scripture sh uh, should have been Proverbs 17, 15, for God hates uh, the righteous being condemned and the uh, guilty uh, going free. Um, I had a, a parent of a, a student who uh, came, the student had done something wrong and the uh, administration was gonna put the student out, gonna expel him. And in, in any way, this father came up. Well, this father and I got to talking about the uh, student and the situation and he was asking the administration to give his son a chance uh, that he hadn't been in his life, he had been incarcerated. And this man shared with me that he had been incarcerated for 18 years oh. and uh, for something that he did not do, uh, which is uh, really kind of how my mind got on the scripture of innocence and, and guilt and how, how does God see this. And we know that God hates both the innocent being condemned as well as the uh, guilty going free. But anyway, this man said, with having spent 18 years of his life uh, in jail for something that he didn't do, he said, I, I may be wrong for saying this, but I'm kind of sort of grateful. Uh, never heard anybody say that at all, because I, when I hear cases where people have been incarcerated and they're innocent uh, for all of these years, my heart just breaks, it's, it's like, how, my God, how, how can this be? But this man said, I, you know, I don't know if I should feel this way, but I'm kind of sort of grateful uh, for this time. And I said, you've got to tell me why. And he said, uh, sister, uh, I was headed in the wrong direction. He said, if I had been out here, meaning in the community, all of this time, I know I would be dead, and he said, not that, not that it necessarily matters that I was dead, but I would not have done anything good with my life. And what would I have to give this boy? What would I have left for him? And that just did something to me. Oh. So, and, and I sh I'm sharing that to say that even though many of us may not have the clothing and the other things that we think we might have by doing what God has asked us to do, God knows where we are and what we need, and he works with us where we are. And that is what helps to get us redeemed and saved. And for that, we have to be grateful. Amen. So what portion of our offerings are we supposed to give? Somebody read Deuteronomy 16, verse 17. Chapter 16, verse 17 in Deuteronomy. What portion of our offerings are we supposed to give? Because you know, there are a lot of people who think, I can see that we're commanded to tithe. And we have Adventists who faithfully tithe, give zero offering, zero offering. Now, this is why I got my bulletproof vest on. The majority of us don't tithe. The majority of us don't tithe. The majority of us do not offer the Lord, do not return to the Lord in offering. We don't. We neither tithe nor we offer. The majority of us. When I'm saying us, I'm specifically now talking about Adventists, but it's also true in other denominations. The majority of us don't do either one. And I want to ask a question. If we come here and we talk about that we understand what the Lord has given us in salvation and grace and the Holy Spirit and changing our life and et cetera. How do we justify that? How do we rationalize that, that we have nothing 
that we are obligated to return to him. How do we do that? But we are. But what portion for offerings? He says 10% for tithe, but what does he ask us to give in an offering? Does anybody have Deuteronomy 17, verse 16? 16, verse 17? Yes, please read it. Deuteronomy 16, 17. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessings of the Lord thy God, which, has, which he has given thee. Hmm. That's not a percentage. How do you figure that out? <laughs> Every man is supposed to give according as he is able, according based on how he has been what, Elder? According to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given thee. Okay. That's not a, a, so how do you figure it out? How do you figure it out? Or do you even bother to try to figure it out? The scripture tells us that we should purpose in our heart to return to the Lord, right? These offerings. And he's not saying give me this percent. But I shared with you last week that the children um, of Israel were tithed and offering maybe 33% of their income. Real, that 33% because they were triple tithing. They had all these special offerings and et cetera. But how do you decide? How much are you grateful? For what are you grateful? If God has given you everything, how do you determine what you're going to return to him? And everyone who's sitting in here, who's tithing and offering, if you haven't answered these questions for yourselves, I'm wondering, and me too, what does that mean? Yes, Sister Elise. <laughs> sure if it's saying give cheerfully not thinking of that not calculating would be the answer okay mm -hmm. giving cheerfully he does want us to give cheerfully like and not we, calculating you're happy giving it's not like uh if i give this much then i do this with the other one but you, you give it as to you but cheerfully okay how many of you have a job right now if you have a job, raise your hand. How many have an income that you're giving? Once a week, once every other week, once a month. How many of you have an income of some sort that you're getting something? How much of what you're getting is yours? Where did it come from? Okay, so, you're, so all of it that you're getting, whether you're getting it weekly, monthly, twice a week, whatever, it came from God, right? And so he's giving you increase, right? He's giving you increase. Is his giving you that increase all the time? Or at least as long as you have what you have? Every week, every two weeks, once a month, whatever. Is he faithful and you're getting that? So then he's systematic and faithful towards us. Why do we not have to think about how we're systematically faithful to him? Why do we don't think that we have to do that? Yes, sir. I see the time is up, but there are many answers to this question. I'm just going to give a couple. Uh, one is there's a fractured relationship going on there. It's like a man and a woman living together. He's working, she's not and he's not helping her with any finances. That's a fractured relationship. So if we are in partnership with God, and he gives us so much, and he's asking, oh, could you give me just a little bit? And we say, no, 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 sorry, I can't give you anything. That is indicative of a fractured relationship. And secondly, just one other point. Uh, it's an act of disobedience, plain and simple. It's an act of disobedience, because he's asking us to do something, 
and we are saying, sorry, I'm not going to do what you want. I'm closing, and you are quiet. And I'm glad you're quiet, actually, because we really need to think about this. God does take note of the offerings that we give, and it has to come out of a place of being thankful. And our being thankful continually is a sacrifice for us because that is not how we are naturally. And the, and the sacrifice is that we have to give up what we want and what we think. I got this or I didn't get that, so I'm giving this or not giving that for what he thinks and what he wants, what God thinks and what he wants. We have to be sacrificially thankful and it hurts because we see everything that we have as ours when none of it is. And so therefore it is okay for us to come to the sanctuary and to have blessings every week and to live every day and have breath every day and give the Lord nothing. Whether it is our tithe, whether it is our offerings, whether it is our talent, whether it is our time, it is okay for us to give nothing because in reality, we are not thankful. And so that means that the Lord's got to do a work in us to change that stony heart so that we are able to give him. What shall you render? We should be rendering him everything. Put our all on the altar. have to remember that we have to give a tithe and give an offering because the Lord's word said so and also that's you know our blessings you know come from that as well um, I remember it was a time when I used to didn't tithe faithfully and I'm being transparent here because I felt like the little monies that I was getting had to go to either bills or gas or something like that. I know a few of us probably in here have been there, but I had to sit back and reset and start giving God's money first. That's what I had to do. And so along comes with that is paying your tithes on time. That doesn't mean that you get up the next day to pay it or later on that night. That means to pay it on time before Sabbath. Am I correct? All right. So, you know, I always read the end of um, the uh, conclusion for the further thought. And just a little snippet of what Ellen G. White says. And it says, God desires people to pray and to plan for the advancement of his work. But like Cornelius, we are to unite praying with giving. Our prayers and our alms are to come up before God as a memorial. Faith without works is dead. And without a living faith, it is impossible to please God. While we pray, we are to give all we possibly can, both of our labor and our means, for the fulfillment of our prayers. If we act out our faith, we shall not be forgotten by God. He marks every deed of love and self-denial. He will open ways whereby we may show our faith by works. Isn't that awesome? So as we go to um, our next week's lesson um, for Managing for the Master, I think that's a great title, Managing for the Master. Um, our next week's lesson for the adults would be dealing with debt. And I'm sure that's going to be a great one as well. Um, and the kindergarten primary and PowerPoints is the value of wisdom. And Cornerstone. Cornerstone is a very long walk with God. So I pray that you all enjoy your Sabbath school lessons for the week and come back here and let's discuss them. Have a blessed Sabbath.
I'm hardly up here, so when I come up, you guys can just welcome me and say happy Sabbath back. Anyway, I just have two short announcements. Um, reminder to the church board members, tomorrow we have a church board meeting at 10 a.m. Um, you should have received a packet from me by on Tuesday. If you did not, please see me after church or send me an email to clerk at, at clerk at echsda.org. It's new, so I can't remember. So again, it's clerk at echsda.org, okay? And my second announcement is on Sunday, February the 5th at 10 a.m., there will be a church communication virtual 2023 orientation given by the Lake Region Conference 
Um, the communication director is Janine Lender. So please see the announcements online or on the website for detailed information with the Zoom login and things like that. So thank you very much. Have a happy Sabbath and God bless you all. Well, again, happy Sabbath, Emmanuel. It's time for our welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone online and our uh, church family here in person. I'd also like to welcome any visitors we have, if we have any for the first time. If we have any visitors, do you mind standing and tell us your name? Amen. I see one. Mm, okay. Okay. Amen. Praise God. You, first name you say Carl, right? Yeah, he's one of the gentlemen, I believe, from the, where we have Bible study. And we have another one, sir. Your first name, where are you from? Okay. Welcome, Jeffrey. Praise God. Thanks for coming to worship with us. Any other visitors for the first time? Or anybody who hasn't been here maybe in, let's say, the last six months? Anyone else? No? Okay. Okay. What's your first name? John, right. John. Welcome. Thanks for coming to worship with us. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 Brother Nixon, thanks for coming to worship with us. Anyone else? I don't want to overlook anyone. Okay. If not, if you would please stand with me. We welcome the Holy Spirit to be with us for our invocation. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. Father, we all here thank you for life today. We thank you for allowing us into your home. Father, we've come to praise and worship you for all your goodness and greatness. And Father, we pray and ask that your Holy Spirit is with us. And Holy Spirit, we pray and ask that you make our worship acceptable to our God because he is worthy to be praised. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Emmanuel. Good morning. It's family time. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about vacations. So when I came into Sabbath school, I heard Elder Coffee mentioning about how her and her husband just went on a vacation. It was talking about the sands and the waters and the waves. Um, by show of hands, how many people like to vacation? Okay. I love vacationing. My family love vacationing and we love vacationing together. Sister Hardy, where do you like to vacation? Okay, nice, nice. Okay. Sister Naomi, where do you like vacationing most? And Sister Michael, if money was not an object and you can go anywhere in this world that you wanted to go, where would that be? I would say I could be home with my family. Okay. And I would be in Africa and I love to come here and visit my mom and pop and my kids and my family. So that's my answer. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, sometimes we like to vacation by ourselves, 
And sometimes we like to vacation with a friend. Other people like to go with small groups. And yet some of us, like those from Emmanuel, like to go in large groups. <laughs> so I just want to tell you that we are all going on a vacation. Welcome to flight number 2023. We are prepared for takeoff in the new year. Please make sure that your attitudes and blessings are secured and locked in an upright position. All self-destructive devices should be turned off at this time. All negativity, hurt, discouragement should be put away. Should we lose altitude under pressure or encounter some turbulence during this flight, reach up and pull down a prayer. Prayers will automatically be activated by faith. Once faith is activated, you can assist other passengers. There will be no, absolutely no baggage allowed on this flight. The Almighty has cleared us for takeoff. Destination, heaven. Again, welcome aboard and have a happy Sabbath. church. Let me take this awful thing off. I don't like masks, but it's a necessity sometimes. Good morning, church. Good morning. I am so happy to be back here. Thanks uh, for Pastor Horton allowing me to share some more stuff that I think that we ought to know about. Um, I have learned, can I have the first slide, please? I've learned a lot of, since I went to Eden Valley you, um, some of you may know, some of you do know, that I had, I like to say had, I had colon cancer. Not colon, sorry, gallbladder cancer, and they removed it. My heart goes out to the gentleman who has stage four cancer. I'll be praying for you. I'll, I'll, you can have my telephone number, and if you want, God has asked me to be an advocate for those who are sick, and though, especially those who have, have cancer. So I'm not going to ask my husband permission to give you my number, but it's God's work. So you can have my number, and you can talk to pastor if you're feeling having an all-time low, or you can speak with me. However, I want to talk about two things today. And I want to talk about, first I want to thank God that he's given me the strength to be here. I have five minutes to do it, okay, to do what I have to do this morning. I want to talk about... Um, Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, something that I've learned. And all of us can benefit from it. I also want to talk about the sauna therapy. Now, that's, that's my hyperbaric chamber that I have at home. Thank God for it, and thank God for a wonderful husband who, allow, who actually purchased it for me. Now, do you only need a hyperbaric chamber um, therapy when you have cancer? No. The rich, I am not rich. The rich, the football stars, all these people have them in their homes. They have them in the gyms, um, at their homes. And you can use the hyperbaric, you can use the oxygen for any kind of ailment. But specifically, this is what happens when you have cancer and you use a hyperbaric chamber or you call it um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. What happens when you get into it? Now, there's a pressure in the inside of the, the chamber which increases to 1.3 atmospheres. So that's equivalent to 30 to 40 feet underwater. So under that condition, the lungs get lots of oxygen. And what the oxygen do, it, it rushes through the blood system all through the body, and it enhances the body. It increases the white blood cells, and the white blood cells then attack any infection in your body, including cancer. Then what you can do, you can apply any part of your body where the cancer is with, um, my mouth's dry, I'm sorry. You can apply 
a poultice made from castor oil. I'm sorry. You can apply a poultice made from castor oil to help pull out the toxins. The next thing I want to talk about is the sauna. We all heard of a sauna. It's in the gyms. But let me just say something to you. Uh, 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 could, we, could I have the next slide, please? Right. You see me sit there? I'm actually, that particular one is, I'm having um, the therapy. Could you, next slide, please? I'm looking for the sauna. Everybody know what a sauna looks like. That's the other um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy going on there. That's infrared. Keep going. We all know what a sauna looks like. But I, what I want to say to you today is there are two types of saunas. There's a dry heat sauna, which also detoxifies the body. But the most important thing, if you don't remember anything about the sauna, I need to let you know that the infrared sauna is the best one. And this is the difference. With the dry heat sauna, and I had them both at Eden Valley, as a matter of fact, that's a dry heat sauna, okay? There's one that have infrared, and the infrared sauna is extremely important for getting rid of toxins in the body. With the dry sauna, you have to heat it for 45 minutes for it to take effect. With the infrared sauna, you don't. What happens as you turn it on, the infrared attacks the, the problems within your body. So which means that if you buy a dry sauna, the disadvantages are you have to wait for 40 minute, 45 minutes for it to heat up. With the, the infrared sauna, you don't have to wait at all. Okay, and these are some of the benefits that I had from the infrared sauna and that I had from the, um, the, 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 the hyperbaric therapy. And if you want to have the therapy for any kind of ailment or illness you have, there are many clinics around the Chicago area that you can go to. I'm telling you, it's expensive. But you have to think to yourself, it's either I'm going to take um, poisonous medicines, and I'm not knocking medicines, but they are poisonous, or I'm going to do it the natural way. And you know what I mean when I say poisonous medicines, okay? With the infrared sauna, the toxins are flushed out through the skin because you start to sweat profusely, and you're getting rid of the toxins. What it also does, it's, as I said before, it stimulates, it also stimulates the red, the white blood cells, and the white blood cells go on attack to attack any kind of infection or any kind of cancer you have. So how can I get these treatments? All you have to do is to join a gym. Some gyms have the infrared treatment, uh, saunas. Some gyms have just the dry heat. Now, if you, don't, if you aren't able to get to an infrared sauna, don't worry. The regular dry sauna that the gym is always on is going to heat your body just as much, but the effect is not going to be the, going to be the same. Um, I have so much information. I've learned so much since I came down with cancer, and thank God that I have the ability to stand here and talk to you. This Wednesday, quick update, this Wednesday and Thursday was the first time I was able to get back into my gym at home. And I thank God for that. I was able to work out for 30 minutes. Now some would say, okay, you work out, you, you're a vegan for years, how come you have cancer? Cancer is no respect of persons. It hit anyone, everybody, children, men, babies, everybody. You can still get it because you don't know what caused it. It could be the, something in the air. It could be something in the water. It could be something that you've eaten. It comes something you drink. So let me tell you, don't let that phase you. My job as an advocate for the sick and for those who have cancer is to share and don't stop share, sharing. May God bless you. Next week, we're going to talk about the foods you need to eat to avoid you coming down with cancer. And if you come down with cancer, those same foods will help you. I love you. God bless you. Keep praying for me, and I'll continue prayer for you. Hallelujah. I can walk.
Morning, church. You guys sounded real good today. Real good. I like that. Okay. Well, it's time for uh, tithes and offering. And I just want to read something to you real quick. It says, what tithing teaches us? It takes a good amount of faith and humility to give without worrying if you will ever run out of resources. Giving tithes being, we believe that God will provide for our needs. It shows the size of our faith and humility, acknowledge that none of what we own truly belongs to us. Will the deacon come forward, please? Heavenly Father, we ask that these funds that are being received will go for to further thy work, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to tell you, there are many ways to give tithes. And which one of the ways that I'm glad is that you can give it through your church while being here. We've got a, oh, I love the crowd, and it's getting bigger. But we can also give through Emmanuel's website at echsda.org. We can give to Adventist Giving, which is uh, giving online. The other way is just mailing in your, your tithes and offering to Emmanuel Church at 1425 Wilson Avenue in Chicago Heights. says, bring ye all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Prove me not. Does anyone overlook? Amen. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for what we have received, Lord. May it further your work Lord, we know there are times when times get hard. But you've told us, Lord, that you would always open up a window of blessings. That we won't have enough room enough to receive it. Thank you, God. Amen. Well, it's prayer time, Emmanuel. Time we can come together collectively and petition the ear of our God. Anybody here need a prayer? I don't see too many hands. So if you don't need prayer, then you pray for me because I need it. Amen. So I'm going to invite whoever, uh, if you want to come a little closer, if you have a special uh, desire, a special prayer, a special request for yourself or possibly a family member that you'd like to pray for, I'm going to ask you to come a little closer if you, if you so choose. Maybe you feel like you've been under attack from the enemy because he's not playing with any of us. 
the minute we decided we wanted to follow God, there's extra attacks. For the rest of us, if you can kneel where you are, if you prefer to kneel, if you're able to kneel, if not, that's fine. Let us pray. Father God, we first want to thank you for your many, many blessings, none of which are deserved. Father, we pray and ask forgiveness of our sins, transgressions, our iniquities. Father, we pray and ask that you strengthen us to live a life obedient to your word, one that honors and glorifies you, Father. Father, we pray and ask that you ignite a fire in us that cannot be quenched, that we might share and be a witness for you of your goodness, that others may come to know you, that they might be saved. Father, you know each and every one of us are individually, of course. You know our needs, you know our failures, our shortcomings, our battles, our weaknesses. Father, we pray and ask that you touch each and every one of us according to our needs. That you strengthen each and every one of us. Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters who are sick and, and ailing or under the weather. We pray for Sister Odo. We thank you, Lord, that she's here with a great praise report for how you've delivered her and are delivering her. So, Father, we pray and ask you continue to strengthen her and heal her. And Father, we pray and ask you continue to be with Pastor Odo as he ministers to his wife and strengthen him as needed. And Father, we continue to pray ask that you continue to be with our pastor. We thank you for the miracles you've done in his life. We ask you continue to have your hand upon him and his family. Father, we pray for Elder Jeans. We pray and ask you continue to touch her, Father. Continue to strengthen her, Lord, as she continues to work for you. Father, we pray for Brother Avaluku, who has been sick for some time. But last I heard, he was being discharged and sent home. So, Father, we thank you for the progress that's being made. And Father, we pray for Elder Scott. Do you continue to have your hand upon him? Father, we praise and rejoice at what you've done for him in his life. Just a miracle, plain and simple miracle. So we thank you. And Father, we pray for our brother Carl here, who's have some health challenges. But, Lord, we know you're able. So, Father, we pray and ask that you touch him, Father. Father, we pray for the situation in, in Memphis where those who are, took an oath, Lord, to serve and to protect have chose to harm and, and, and murder Father, not just them, so many others, Father. So, Father, we pray for both families, Lord. We pray for peace, Father. And, Lord, we pray for patience for us, knowing that your word says, vengeance is yours, Lord. You shall repay. So everyone will have everything they deserve. So, Father, we pray and ask that when all of this is over and done with, Father, that you change and do what you have to do in each and every one of our lives, Father, that we may be saved, that we may be delivered from all of this sickness, this death, this hatred. Father, we turn to you for deliverance, Father, and victory. Bless us to be overcomers. These things we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. And family, forgive me for my memory, but I pray and ask that you pray for the Bradley Eccles family who suffered a recent loss. Amen. Scripture time. For those who are have their Bibles, turn to Second Kings, fourth chapter, one through seven. I will read the first verse, and you will follow each consecutive. Oh yes, Stan, please. I'm sorry. <laughs> Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the son of the prophet unto Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creator, I'm sorry, and the creditor is come to take upon him my two sons to be bondsmen. Congregation. Then he said, Go, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her. And she poured out. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, and pay your de debts. And Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen and hallelujah. What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Will you say amen? That's right, everybody didn't make it this week. We want to keep the Echoes family in our prayer, the passing of Sister Valerie Bradley. Many of you have known her through the years, but we don't know when, we don't know where. But praise the Lord, we still got an appointment with the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Good to see you. Uh, I'm just up here for a hot second, and I'm going to get out the way and let the word of God come. But first of all, let these praise singers come. Will y'all stand up and turn around? and look at the congregation so they can see your lovely faces. Come on, Christian, stand up. Yeah, it's something about children, something about youth, that joy, you see. I know about it because I once was young, back in the day, but praise God. Um, I want to introduce our speaker today. Most of you know him, but I'm just going to tell you some things I know about him from my heart. First of all, I met his father first, and his father is truly an anointed evangelist. He, he's an anointed down-home evangelist, you know, because those evangelists from the South, they do a little bit differently from the brothers from, and sisters from the Northeast in California, but I met his dad first, and he's truly a chip off the old block in the most positive sense. Uh, and you know, it's a good thing because the generations are still coming and going, and we need the young preachers. God has promised that he pour out his spirit upon our young women and our young men, and that they would prophesy. And so God has called him to be a teacher of the word. He's done evangelism here in 
Chicago, I think 10 or 12 were baptized, 12 or, or more. And then uh, he's done evangelism around the country. He's blessed because he has a wife, Sister Rocky. She's not with him today. She's probably back in Bering Spring doing some other things. But they're a beautiful couple. And uh, I pray that while they're ministering, the Lord will come so we can all go home. He's at our seminary right now, and I could ramble on and on about him. But he has revived my spirit. I think about what some of the older brothers like Helvius Thompson and R.F. Warnick did for me when I was coming along. And I said, man, if I can help or encourage anybody, but this is that kind of brother. So pray for him as he prepares to come after our youth choir. What do we call it? EYC, Emmanuel Youth Choir. Amen. Praise the Lord.
worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Tap of everybody. I'm glad that God is here in this place. Can we just celebrate for a moment that we have young people to sing such a beautiful song? Uh, before we get into our message, I just had a few things I wanted to say. I just wanted to just congratulate uh, the man of God, Dr. Horton for just always inviting me, letting me be a part of this church. And me and my wife, we've been talking about it over and over again. And we're saying, man, this is our church now. This is our home church. And we just love the way that you all treat us, the way that you loved on us. And uh, fortunately, she couldn't be here. She's uh, in Florida on a vacation without me, with her, with her little friends. Uh, but I, I hope she enjoys herself, and uh, she'll be with me next time. But uh, let's get into the word today. Uh, the title of our message is simple. You have all you need. Uh, I don't, you don't have to look at your neighbor, but just say it out loud with me. You have all you need. All right, that was a few people. I need everybody to say it with me. You have all you need. I want you to recognize in here today that you have potential all around you that God has placed, and it's your job to figure out what that stuff is. There are some things in your life that if you could take to the next level, it could be something greater. And I want to give us some principles. I think that the Bible has, has put, put us together in, in 2 Kings chapter 4 that I think will really be helpful for us. So let's go there. 2 Kings chapter 4, and it was read earlier, but I'm going to read it in your hearing in the ESV version. It sounds a little closer to how we talk. The Bible says this. Now, the wife of one of the sons of the prophet cried to Elijah. Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. Now, what you need to understand here is that our sister has lost her husband. She's lost the love of her life. And now she's speaking to the man of God, Elijah, the prophet, and she's telling him the scenario. And she's using these words of appeasement. I hope you see it. She's saying, my husband, one of the sons of the prophet, has died. Then she says, don't you know that my husband loved the Lord? She's laying it on thick for him, amen? The Bible goes on to say, uh, the creditor has come to take my children to be his slaves. And Elijah says this, what shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in your home. She's face to face. This widow is face to face with Elijah. She has a problem that's not going to go away. The creditor is going to come and seize her children. And I wish it weren't true, but biblically, he had the right to do so. If you had a debt that was assigned to you, somebody had to pay that debt. So the creditor is in his biblical right to take the children and put them in slavery to pay off the debt. She's lost the love of her life, and now she's forced to raise her two children as a single mother, and now she has a looming debt that she owes, and her life, her normal, is being threatened. Somebody understands in, with me in this place today that this is real life. You don't, the devil doesn't always count to three. You don't always get to catch your breath between the moments of life. Right when you get out of one thing, it can feel like you're getting drop kicked into something else. 
I wish I had somebody here who knew what I was talking about. Listen to me, tragedy is not a respecter of persons. It doesn't matter what you've been through, who you are, where you live, where you went to school at. Tragedy comes for us all. I mean, sister girl lost her husband, and now she's about to lose everything else. Can you imagine? I mean, this thing is serious in this place today. But one of the things that I'm learning as I'm reading this verse was something that was before me. And, and, and the weirdest thing is, when I went to make this sermon, I started it maybe about two years ago. I don't usually cook sermons for that long. I, I'm not that guy. When I get it, I fire it out the chamber. But every time I would go to preach it, God would say, no, 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 not yet. And so the other weekend, I was back home in Alabama. And my mother was telling me about a situation. I began to start rattling off this sermon to her. And she was like, I don't know what that is, but you need to preach that. And so I said, Lord, I'm going to listen to you through my mother. And so I decided to preach this message today. And I know it's going to hit somebody right where it needs to. Because there's some of us in here who are going through something. You may not be finna lose your children to a creditor, but you feel like your life is closing in on you. It feels like everything is happening all at once. And if that's you today, I've got a message for you. So get this. This unnamed widow is standing for Elijah and she needs him to solve this problem. And this is the thing that gets me with Elijah. She comes to him and says, my children are about to be taken away. My husband are, is dead. And Elijah responds like this. What do you want me to do? Huh? Number one, I need you to get a clue. Do I need to spell it out? H-E-L-P, help me. I have a problem and I'm coming to you for help. And I think Elijah was kind of at, at a standstill because he was not sure what he could do. Because this is one of the things you need to understand about miracles. Miracles operate in reality. Y'all not hearing me. Miracles operate in reality. He could not force the creditor to forget the debt. I, I hope y'all are getting that. So Elijah's trying to figure out what can I do to make your ends meet? And this is the thing that you need to get today. What do you have in your house? What does she, she says? I have nothing. Your servant has nothing. This word that, that he uses is a word in. It means nothing, empty. Oftentimes when we say the fool, it, it, they call a person a fool in the Bible. It's because that person is empty of anything useful. When the Bible says that Sarah was without child and she was older, the Bible uses this word and says that her stomach was empty. This woman says, I have nothing in my house. I have nothing. If you have nothing, then you have no potential for growth. If you have no seed, then you can have no tree. If you have no money, you can make no investment. If you have nothing, there is no potential for growth. But here's the good news. If you have something, there's always the potential for growth. Y'all miss that. Check this out. Check this out. She says, I have nothing. See, some of us will get this in a minute because all of us can list all the things we don't have. I don't have the man I thought I should get. I don't have the wife I thought I should get. I don't have the job. I don't have this. I don't have that. And all you can do is list ad nauseum all the things that you don't have and you fail to recognize the opportunities that you do have. She says your servant has nothing. This is you get this in a minute. You need to stop saying, I have nothing except this old raggedy husband. I got nothing but this old tired wife. You better not look at your wife right now. I got nothing but these old baby kids. I've got nothing but this beat up house. 
this tore up hoopty, this worn out everything I have. We are so quick to list what we don't have, wishing we could trade places with other people and fail to see the potential we have around us. Elijah says, what do you have in your home? She says, I have nothing but a jar of oil. You need to get this, that she had this jar of oil in what we would call an earthen vessel. Everybody say that with me, a earthen vessel. An earthen vessel was a pot made out of mud and sometimes metal. An earthen vessel is a pot made out of mud and sometimes metal. It wasn't as fancy. Somebody wasn't sitting on a wheel spinning it. It was clumped together and it would hold a little bit of stuff. It was more like a flask. It was small. It wasn't huge. It was small. It carried a little bit of oil in it. And this is the thing that you need to understand. Because God is trying to give us something very powerful in this place today. It was something in the jar of oil that she didn't quite see. And she needed the eyes of faith to be able to understand it to a better degree. Listen to me. We don't always have to ask God for more. I knew it would get quiet in here. <laughs> You don't always have to ask God for something shiny and new. The principle here isn't that you need something more of something or something to be new. You just need God to stretch what you have. Oh, my goodness. I wish I had a witness in here. You don't need a new marriage. You need God to stretch your patience in your marriage. You don't need a new family. You need God to expand your creativity in your family. You don't need to trade bank accounts with Bill Gates. You just need God to stretch what you have. Some of us need to, I love when we're talking about tithe because that's when it gets real quiet in church. I don't know what it is about money, but when pastors or anybody starts talking about money, everybody starts acting funny. Acting like we don't all like money up in here. Oh, don't look at me funny. Everybody likes money. I don't love it, but I like it. And so when we were talking about times, it was quiet. My sister, she had to pull teeth to get some of y'all to talk up in here. And the reality is, some of us, we've been praying that God would give us more money. And we've been trying to figure out what a hole in our pocket is. And the hole in our pocket comes from the fact that we won't be faithful to God with the small things. I learned this when I was in my early teenage years. My grandma was begging me to pay my tithes. She would say, if you pay your tithes, I'll pay you what you gave God. I said, no, nah, I, don't, I don't need that. I'm good. Let me figure this out on my own. And I would make a check, and then that check would be gone the next day. And I couldn't even tell you where the money went. But then when I start being faithful with my tithes, I started to see that God could stretch $20 and make it spend like $100. Y'all ain't listening to me in this place. You don't always need God to give you more. Sometimes you just need God to stretch what you already have. You don't always need shiny and new. You just need God to put some of his super on top of your natural. I had a member at one of my churches. Y'all know I had some of the strangest members. I had a member of one of my churches. They were playing the lotto. See, when you play the lotto here, you can just go anywhere and get it. But when in Alabama, you got to travel across the state line to get the lotto ticket. And so I wasn't feeling that. I'm saying, you know, I don't want you to waste your money. I don't think you need to be involved in stuff like that. Then she said, hold on, hold on. I've been praying that God would make me a millionaire. And so I've been faithfully going up into Georgia every two weeks and buying all these tickets. And I've been praying that God would make me a millionaire. And so I sat down with her and we went through her budget and we found out how much money she was spending on gas and lottery tickets. You didn't need God to make a miracle. You just needed to live on a budget. Listen to me. You don't need God to give you more all the time. Sometimes you just need him to stretch what you already have. I like this part. 
He says, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbor, empty vessels and not too few. Go in and shut the door behind yourself, you and your sons, and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So he went in and shut the door behind her and her sons. And as they poured, they brought more vessels. This is the thing you need to understand. There is a blessing in being poured out. You know, I haven't explained it, so you shouldn't get that yet. <laughs> there is a blessing in being poured out. Uh, when I look and I read this story, it blows my mind that so much was in so little. How could you pour out and fill your home with bunches of vases and tubs and everything that was holding oil in there that day? How could something that could fit in your hand be stretched out to fill out so many things? How could something so small produce so much? It, it showed me this, that there was more in the jar than what people could see on the outside. There was more to it than what other people could view. An earthen vessel was made out of? OK, come on, work with me. K mud or clay and metal. You didn't see into it. You didn't know what was going to be in it. It was a small thing that was made out of mud. Thank you. Thank you. And so as she began to pour it out and she was filling the vessels in our home, my mind was blown because I just couldn't see how something so small could produce so much. And it wasn't until that the oil was poured out that you could see what the naked eye could not see. I didn't know that something so tiny could fill up a neighborhood of glasses. I didn't know that a jar in the oil could do so much. It wasn't until it was poured out that you could see what was on the inside of it. Now get this, 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 this widow, she comes to Elijah and she seems to be looking for a miracle in which God could pour into her. She wanted somebody to hit that cash app, that Venmo, that Western Union, that MoneyGram, and solve the problem like this. But God didn't give her a quick fix. This was a fix that she had to go and talk to her neighbors, go back home, fill up jars. It was a whole process to this miracle. And this is the thing that really got me, because not, listen to me, we love when God opens up the windows of heaven and pours out a blessing that we don't have room enough to believe. We love that. We love saying that. But not only is it important that God pours into us, there are moments in life where God demands that we are poured out. There are moments in life where God demands that what is on the inside of us is revealed. Not what you talk, but what you really are. Not what you profess and pretend to be on Saturday for an hour. I'm talking about what you are during the week. Life pours you out, listen to me in this place, when the pain in your side becomes a bad diagnosis and now the faith you have been preaching about, you now have to live out. Life pours you out when that child you've been praying for seems to get only worse. Life pours you out when that person who says I do now says I don't. Life pours you out when your nightmares become reality. And here's the shout. When life pours you out, it reveals what's on the inside of you. And see, just like what was on the inside of that oil, we didn't know that it was so much. Y'all not hearing me. You didn't know how strong you was until life poured you out. You didn't know how resilient you were until you, could, until you went through what you went through. You didn't know you could rise from the ashes. You didn't know you could take a licking and keep on ticking. You didn't know you didn't have to take it to the streets, but you could take it to the prayer closet. God put more in us than what others could see. And it wasn't until life poured you out that you were able to, listen to me, faith untested is faith untrusted. 
You can talk about all the faith you got. You can talk about all this and how you've got faith larger than a mustard seed. But until life pours you out, it's not proven. You can tell me what you believe. But until you've been through it and standing still on that same space, that's when you prove what you really believe. I like the way the Bible talks about this. It's clear that God has put more in us than what anybody can see. He's made us strong. He's made us resilient. I like the way Second Timothy puts it. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of self-control. I like the way Second Corinthians puts it. We have these treasures in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We hold these truths. We hold this truth of God of God being on the inside of us. Do you know how powerful that is? An earthen vessel was made out of mud and metal. It was worthless. Sometimes they would just throw these pots out. If it got chipped, most of the time they wouldn't even try to fix it. These were things, it was, like, it, it was almost like uh, plastic dishware. I know some of y'all like to keep that around and wash them, but no, no, you're supposed to throw those away. They would use it sometimes and throw them away. Earthen vessels had no real value to people. But God uses us as earthen vessels. And he puts his spirit on the inside of us. And so that we know that when there's something good that happens, we can't take the credit for it. We have to give all the credit and honor to God. I love that. So get this. We have all what we need because God has placed a, the potential around us and it's our job to discover what that is. We also have all we need because God has given us blessings. He has, he has made us strong. He's made us courageous. He's made us more than conquerors. But not only that, number three gives us our biggest reason why we have what we need. It's because God's plans are always bigger than just getting by. Remind me, she comes to Elijah with a debt problem. She just wants somebody to deal with this debt so her sons won't go into slavery. And she's asking Elijah, you know, I, I'm putting this out to you. I, I'm not really trying to just make it plain, but I have this problem. I made it pretty simple. All I need is some finances, something to fix this issue. My husband was a prophet. He loved the Lord. This is the least of what you can do. We got to stop praying these prayers where we bargain with God based on what we feel like we deserve or have earned. Because in reality, we have not earned anything but death. But because of his grace and love, I don't have to be ashamed to ask him for the things that I need. I don't have to bargain with him based on where I think I am. This is the beautiful part. They go and they... Uh, get done pouring out all the oil. She goes to the man of God and she says this. He says, them, go and sell and pay your debt and you and your sons can live on the rest. She was just trying to get a bill paid. And God set her up with a 401k. She just had a moment in time where she needed help with. And God set her up so good that her and her family can live off the rest. Stop trying to figure out what you can bargain with God, what you feel like you deserve with God. Listen to me. I've been trying to figure this thing out, but I couldn't even come up with a real theological way to put it. So I just put it like this. God always has wow in mind. His plans are always going to blow you away. And when you settle for the small things, God, God so love it, he'll give you those small things. But God always has wow in mind. God, I just want a husband. God, I just want a wife. Man, God wants a family for you. He has bigger in mind than just one thing. 
God's already at the 10th, the 12th, and the 13th step. Why are you still on the first one? Check this out. This is the thing that really got me about this. As she's pouring into these vessels, the Bible says that it wasn't until all the vessels were filled that the oil stopped flowing. Now, somebody's going to get mad at me, but it's okay, because I don't live in Chicago, and I'm going home after this. But don't be trying to mean mug me while we're eating food over there. But check this out. The oil stopped flowing when there were no more vessels to be filled. Look at the church today. Could it be possible that one of the reasons why we are struggling to do things that are almost supernatural is because everybody comes filled? I knew it would get quiet up in here. There was no more oil to be poured out because this is the thing about God. He doesn't waste anything. Whether it's the fishes and the five loaves of bread, he doesn't waste anything. He's not finna waste food, he's not finna waste oil, and he's not finna waste your time. We come here week after week of a heavy diet of Instagram, Facebook, daytime television. We come in here filled to the brim with all the foolishness of the world. And then get mad and say, I didn't get nothing from the service. How could you? You've been filling your palate all week with the things of this world and then wanting a poor preacher to try and fix that in one hour. Here's the beautiful thing. As much space as there was to be filled, there was oil for it. I thought somebody would say amen up in here. As much space as there were to be filled, there was oil for it. I love that because it means that God's supply isn't the issue. It's not that God doesn't have enough for me. He has a cattle on a thousand hills. Whatever my issue is, whatever my situation is, he has what it takes to cover it. The only issue is, am I empty for him to fill me up? I wish I had a witness in here, somebody who said, Lord, fill my cup and fill it up till I want no more. Is there anybody in here who says, you know what? I need to be filled. I recognize that with God, I have all I need. He said he's got potential and opportunities all around me. And it's my job to discover what those are. God has put in me strength, power and resiliency. He's made it so the things that I go through shouldn't take me out. And more than anything, God has a wow in mind for me. I don't know what that is, but I know it's on the other side of whatever I'm going through. It's bigger than what I can imagine. I like the way Ellen White says it. She says, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's idea for his children. If that don't move you, I don't know what will. You mean to tell me God's thoughts for me are that big? Because my thoughts for myself aren't that big. I'm trying to figure out what I can bargain and, and make, make sense of, but God has things that won't even make sense from my point of view. So if there's anybody who says, you know what, Pastor, I hear what you're saying. I've got all I need. I need you to stand with me this moment. If there's anybody, I see you, my brother. Just stand with me. God, I've got all I need. You've given me potential. You've given me strength. You've given me all the things that I need to succeed.
this story was moving to me because it puts us in a place where we all are at times, in need. We all are, have places in our lives where we come to God and say, God, I can only go so far with this one. If you don't step into this, if you don't put some of your super on top of my natural, I won't make it another day. Everything's happening all at once. I need you. And maybe there's somebody in here as the walls are closing in on you this week, this month, this year already. We already it's crazy. We just got into 2023 and it sounds like it's already got some of us in a stranglehold. I refuse to finish this year out like that. But I want us to leave this place today being willing and able to not just bring up all the complaints of the things that we don't have and think about all the things that we wish we had, but start to notice the opportunities that we do have. There's potential in your home. Don't tell me your family's all it can be and you don't even have family worship, please. Don't tell me your husband ain't what he should be. You won't even pray for him. Don't tell me your wife isn't what you need her to be. You won't even pray for her. There's potential, but will you grab it? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for the words that were spoken today. Lord, don't let us leave this place unable to recognize the opportunities that you have around us not to be able to recognize the strength that you created us with and not to be able to facilitate a deeper and closer walk with you. Lord, we're praying today for something incredible. Lord, we don't know what that wow is for each and every one of us, but we know that you have it in mind for all of us. You, you have something that will blow our mind. But there's some struggle, there's some issues, there's some things we might have to go through before we can enjoy that. Give us the strength to endure. The knowledge to see what's going on. And the patience to wait on you. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen and amen. I get it. Thank you, man. So how many of you feel like, feel like running on now? Yeah. Praise God. I don't feel no ways tired. Man, I was taking notes, preacher. We are those vessels made of mud and metal. I even looked it up, man, about 10 different metals in the human body. And if you've ever been anemic, you know that because you know you need some iron to go with the hemoglobin and we could go on through it. But God is speaking to us there through his word. Amen. So be of good courage. And, you know, we're going to reflect on that tomorrow morning. We have a board meeting. But, man, you brought a message to us. Because I think, and, and y'all forgive me, I think our last board meeting, we, we kind of did a self-diagnosis about what we ain't and what we are not, you know, and so forth. But we're going to kind of flip the script and try to look at what uh, is in the house. Nobody said amen. That's all right. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, and this is an example of what he preached about. We have in the house with us today another brother that I'm going to call a man of God. Dr. Lafayette Russell, I'm going to ask you to come forward at this time. And uh, I, have, I have gotten to know him in the past few months. God has been so good. We have been praying, especially we men, and actually I guess probably the sisters have been praying more than us, that God would send some men to our church. Amen. 
And the Lord has sent that. He sent our uh, young preacher, younger. Hope you don't mind me saying that, man. Yeah, because he said he called the young men because they are strong. Amen. <laughs> and uh, the Lord's been sending us men, the men like Brother Dante and Daniel and others. Amen. We're going to keep them in our prayers. But uh, Dr. Lafayette Russell, and I feel like I've known you longer than I have, you know. <laughs> he said it seemed like it's been a long time. Hey, Amen. We're on this pilgrim journey. We are on this pilgrim journey. And he wants to join this fellowship by profession of faith. He has studied the 20. Amen. Praise God. He has studied the 28 doctrines, and we are in the process of continuing our studies. But he is ready uh, to step out by faith. If you get to know him, you will understand that he's a person who's rooted already in the Word of God. You know, he just needed to flip the switch on a few things here and there. And I'm going to ask if the lady of his life, the woman of his life, will come forth also at this time. This is his fiance, who we all know so well, Sister Joanne Harding. <laughs> you didn't mind me calling you out, did you? Not at all. All right. All right. His fiance. Isn't that a great thing? Oh, the God is so good. And we're just going to go through these uh, vows for profession of faith very quickly here. And then I'm going to ask you as our congregation, if somebody will make a motion to accept him as a member, and then we'll vote on it. And I'm, I'm just trusting that everybody's going to say amen, all right. And then we're going to give him the uh, right hand of fellowship as we leave and end this service. And after this service, there is a meal for our youth choir, a meal for the youth choir. And we're also going to serve the, the preacher. Amen. We're going to serve the preacher. We're not going to let him go back to Berrien Springs hungry. Amen. Thank you. And thank you so much, Brother Greg Tolson and uh, Sister Trinika Michael and uh, Nikki and all that team. All right, so let us go into the, prof the vows for the profession of faith. Uh, Dr. Brother Russell, do you believe that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? All right. And do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for your sins? And do you believe that through faith in his shed blood, you are saved from sin and its penalty? Do you renounce the world and its sinful ways? And have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Allow, I'm sorry, believing that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart. Do you accept uh, the, by faith the righteousness of Christ as your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary? And do you accept the promise of his transforming grace and the power through the Holy Ghost to live a loving, Christ-centered life in your home and before the world? Do you believe the Bible is God's inspired word and the only true rule of faith and practice for the Christian? And do you covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study? Do you accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of his will? And it is, your, is it your purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ and the Holy Spirit to keep this law, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and a, as a, also as memorial to creation. Okay. Do you look forward to the soon coming of Jesus Christ and the blessed hope when the mortal shall put on immortality and corruptible put on in corruption, and we could just keep on going through that. But anyway, and um, do you prepare, I'm sorry, and as you prepare for the soon coming of the Lord, will you witness to his loving salvation and help to prepare others by your life and word? Amen. And do you accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church according to Revelation 12 and 14? And do you believe in church organization and is it your purpose to support the church 
by your tithes and offerings and by your personal effort and influence, gift and talents. Do you believe your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will you honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, abstaining from all unclean foods and from the use, manufacture or sale of alcoholic beverages or the use, manufacture or sale of tobacco or the use uh, or misuse of or trafficking in narcotics or other drugs? Do you know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you purpose by the grace of God to fulfill his will by ordering your life in harmony with those principles? Do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized, and I'm sorry I'm reading the wrong one, you have been baptized, amen. All right, this is profession of faith, not by baptism, amen. And so you've accepted the teaching of baptism by immersion. Yes. And then lastly, do you accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy according to Revelation 12 and 14 and other scripture, and that people of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, race, and language are invited and accepted into this fellowship? And is it your desire to be a member of this local congregation, the Emmanuel Seventh-day Adventist Church, a part of the world church. Yes. Amen. Praise the Lord. You have heard from our brother. And so now it'd be uh, in order to have a motion to accept uh, Dr. Lafayette Russell as a member of this fellowship, of this congregation, this church, this movement. And could I have that motion? Praise the Lord. Is there a second? Okay, the motion has been made and seconded that we accept. Dr. Russell, as a member of this fellowship, are you ready for the question? All in favor, please signify by aye. aye. Those opposed, nay. The motion is unanimously carried. Praise the Lord. Dr. Russell, uh, would you like to share something with the congregation? We talked a little bit in the back, but uh, anything you want to share? Oh, I, first I'm going to give God a word of praise. You know. As you get to know folks, you learn more and more about them. And, you know, growing up, I always wanted to be a singer. If my wife were here, she's in the back. Isn't that right, honey? Matter of fact, my wife, my wife will tell you how when we were dating back at Andrews, I used to sing to her, man. And later on, I realized that's, that's, that's how I knew she was loving. She tolerated it. But here we have, I'm serious, but here we have a brother who can truly sing. And he was telling me all them technical music terms about tenor and this, that. But anyway, and I said, man, you just don't know how God is going to bless the congregation. But, Doc, anything you want to share with us? Yes. I'm glad to be a part of uh, Emmanuel. Um, we have a good pastor here. I've been coming since last year. I've enjoyed his teaching. He's some, Dr. Horton is someone that I can learn because I never profess to know everything. I'm always willing to learn, so I keep an open mind. Um, also, I've enjoyed the, the Sabbath school teaching, and I've been studying it throughout the week, so I come prepared. I, I don't say a lot, but I like to read. I like to read. And um, well, you have a good pastor, have a good first lady at the church. And I uh, just thank God for each and every one of you. And I'm also delighted there that no one opposed me being a member. <laughs> Praise God. Uh, I love the Lord. God got my attention in October of 1975, and I've been living for the Lord since then. I used to sing uh, quartet, do quartet singing, and I broke away from that, and I was singing as a solo artist, and uh, the Lord have blessed me. I was singing all the other stuff, Eddie Kendricks, Smokey Robinson's, the Stylistics, uh, Blue Magic, the Dells, and the Dramatics, and all of those people. But after God saved me, 
God bless me. Um, you know, God blesses us with many different gifts and talents, and I begin to work at it and perfect what God has given me. I am a recording artist. Uh, the Lord blessed me with my own company, ABLM Enterprise. And so what I do, I mean, I record independently. I've done two CD uh, recordings, and I'm presently working on a third. But I love the Lord. I love singing. I've been singing since I was eight years old. But I don't sing to entertain. I sing to minister. Oh, one other thing. I thank God for my fiance. I don't want to leave that out. She is a beautiful person. I love her. And we're going to get married this year. The Lord say the same in July. Praise God. So I have a lot to be thankful for. And one other thing I want to say, I thank God for Pastor Cody. I listened to him last year. And when they had the revival services, I was there every night. I really enjoyed his teaching. He's a young man that uh, teaches the word of God. And then not only that, he's an example. Because anybody can preach, but we have to live what we preach as well. And all the brothers here, Minister Bowles, and all the other ones that I've met, Brother Antoine, Elder, Elder Beckon, and some of the other ones that I can't name any names right now. But I uh, thank God for each and every one of you. And that brother sitting over there, I, I, don't, I don't remember his name, but he came, and uh, Brother Steve, and he came and he introduced himself to me. And I tell you, I appreciate when people come and do good things like that. Uh, and I like to be a person that's approachable. I'm, I'm not real starchy or anything like that. I love God's people. So with that being said, I'm going to give it back to uh, Pastor Horton. All right, now give it back to me only if you finished. Because I was enjoying everything you were saying, man. Man, the Lord is so good. He's so good. Um, well, that's it for today. Praise the Lord. We're gonna, I'm going to ask Pastor uh, Cody to come back up and give our benediction, if we all will stand. And then we're going to give the right hand of fellowship. We're going to ask you to stand right here, uh, Doc Russell, and you can stand right there. And then we can start right here and just come right around, and we're going to give uh, the right hand of, of fellowship. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace, Lord. We thank you for our new brother in Christ who is with us today. Lord, as we eat our food, we just want to pray a blessing over that as well. Amen. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. We're going to ask if, as you're able, just come on through. Let's get a right hand of fellowship. Look at that. My sister, Tranika.
Hello, hello, can I have everyone's attention? Just a quick reminder to bring your children out to rehearsal because we want to continue to grow and keep them here. Next Friday, yeah, oh, I know, yeah. Next Friday. Um, also, we have a meal for the children 13 and under and their parents, so if you can stick by for that, we will greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Drought for way too long. We need to sing our freedom song. Oh Lord, we need a touch from you. We really need a touch from you. Lord, we need to hear your voice. Our hearts are open, we have no choice Oh Lord, we need a touch from you We really need a touch from you Send your last
Send your life. 